So today I'm going to talk about Microsoft All Ins. Uh, this is what I do every single day at work. Uh, many people at my work are afraid to work in Microsoft All Ins. Don't know why. Um, so I thought I'd come out to you lovely people today and do a talk on it. My presentation isn't quite as pretty as uh, Lucy's was. It's just code and diagrams. Um, and there is no live demo because when you're developing in Orleans, you start your silo, which you'll learn in a minute, and it takes seven minutes to start up, and then you have to start your client, and that takes three minutes to start up. And that's a quarter of the talk gone straight away. So let's get right into it. What is Microsoft Orleans? As you can probably guess, it's made by Microsoft. It's called a virtual active framework, which I'll explain in a minute. Uh, it is open source, and its primary goal is to be scalable for the cloud. Now, this started off in Microsoft's research division um, back in about 2009, 2010, um, and then was started to be used internally at Microsoft in 2011. Uh, it was used on the popular game Halo 4 to handle a lot of their statistics. Um, so it's very shortly after being used in deployment that it started to be used for major games. And then in 2015, they released it to the public and people like Dunhumby took it on, started developing it. So, hands up, has anyone come across an actor framework before? Couple of you, fantastic. So it's not a new idea, I think it was the 1980s that Active Framework was started off. Um, I'm sure somebody will correct me after later. And we're going to look at this. I'm not very good. I'm sorry. And um, this is some ACA code that I've just stolen from some code project somewhere. Uh, in it, we're saying, right, let's create our actor system. Let's create our actor. Let's set up our actors. It's a lot of work. Now. Virtual Active Frameworks are a little different. You don't handle creating, you don't handle destroying, you don't handle where your actors live, you don't handle even their memory. They just, from now on we'll call them grains. You just ask Microsoft Orleans, give me a grain, and then you can use it. Now, we have a research paper here that Microsoft did. I've tried to read it. It's very long, it's very technical, it's not very fun. If you want, uh, I'll be in the pub afterwards. You can come get this link from me. And if, you want, if you're into that sort of thing, you can have a read of it. OK, so first bit of terminology we've seen is grains. Second bit of terminology, activate and deactivate. This can be thought of as your create and your, dis your destroy. So let's get into some actual code. Here, well, we'll paint the picture of, let's get some requirements down. So you, Wednesday morning, your boss has just come to you, right, we're going to start an auction house website. It's going to be scalable in the cloud, and you've just watched a fantastic talk on Orleans the night before. So you come to you say, right, what are my domain objects? Well, I have a bidder who is going to want to bid on items in an auction. So at the top here, we have our interface, I bid a grain. It's our contract to our actor. If we want to make the actor do something by either an ask, you're going to ask for something, or you're going to tell it something, we have to go via these. Now, at the top here, we have iGrain with string key. Now, there's a couple of interfaces that Microsoft or package into their Orleans framework. So you've got iString key, iInt key, iGuid key. Uh, there's some compound keys as well. For this talk, I'm just going to use string keys, but if you ever come to use Microsoft, you pick the one that's most appropriate for your application. So running down the actual uh, uh, methods we have in our contract, we have our enter auction. Let's just say users can enter one auction at a time and bid on that auction. They need to bid, obviously. What's an auction if nobody's spending money? And we have our notify latest bid. So if we've been outbid, we need to know. We need to know how much we've been outbid by. The eagle-eyed among you will have noticed task, task bool, task. 
is because everything in Microsoft Orleans needs to be a task. If you try to do something that isn't a task, hit compile, compile error, because you're not allowed to do it. Everything is built on task because everything goes through their TPL, through their own task scheduler. So we're going to look at the implementation of our bidder grain. So we'll keep things short. We'll look at each individual method and how we would implement it. Now, just in our skeleton, we have our bid amount. That's how much we bid at that time. And we have whatever auction we have in. Notice that this is called iAuction grain. So this means that we have a reference to a grain that exists somewhere. And here's a bit of skeleton that we don't care about for the time being, but we'll dig in to that enter auction bit to start with. All of your grains must inherit from this grain base interface, uh, base object. This is because it will open up many different um, base properties and methods that make using Microsoft Orleans actually useful. So off we go. So our enter auction. So if you haven't guessed already, our auction grain is also iGrain with string key. We have passed it a string name. We want to enter this auction, um, I don't know, for a new bike, we'll say. We access our base class to say grain factory. All of our grains come from a grain factory. You say grain factory, hey, give me a grain. It creates the grain somewhere in the cluster. I don't care where as a developer, I want to write simple code. So I fetch an auction grain of type, I don't know, eBay, bike, something, something, something. And I say, right, auction grain, I'm going to enter your auction. But the auction needs to know who I am. So I tell it, right, my ID is to get my primary key string. So as a grain string key, that will return back, um, I, I can't remember whether I named the bidder, if I named it at all. We'll call it Dan, because I'm called Dan. So I say, right, enter this auction for me. That will enter the auction, and we'll cover the auction grain code in a bit. Now we've got our bid. So we created our auction grain before, and we attached it to a method here that I've forgotten to include. And we're going to say, right, auction grain, I'm bidding this amount. So some user somewhere, this could be an API, a web, a mobile app, has pushed in and said, right, go bid this amount. And I say to the auction grain, right, I'm going to bid this amount, and it's going to tell me if I'm successful. And if I'm successful, I know to set that as my bid amount. And then I'm going to return back to whatever is calling me to say, yep, you were successful, or no, you weren't. So they can try again or give up. Now we have notify latest bid. It's our last method in the bidder grain for now. And we're saying that we want to be told who is the latest bidder and how much is that latest amount. Because we may want to react somehow. We may have a grain that just automatically bids again. So we say, right, if the bidder that has been passed in does not match my key string, set the bid amount to zero, we know we've lost. And we'll have here to do raise notification. And if we get time, we'll look at some observers and we'll show you how you can notify out of the Orlean system and into your normal code base. So now let's look at the auction grain interface. Again, we have this I grain with string key. We have our tasks to say what we're doing. And as you saw before, we have our bid amount and our enter bidder. So let's get into our auction grain implementation. So again, just bare bones, we'll do, do, we'll do it later. We we'll have a list of active bidders. Now, you can probably guess that this is going to hold all of our IDs that we passed in as part of the interruption. And we have whatever the current winning bid is. Oh, and don't forget, grain on there, because it's important. And you'll be surprised how many people forget it. So we've entered our auction. Very simply, we're just going to add to the list of bidders. 
Pay close attention to this here because this is gonna change in a couple of slides to something else because our requirements have changed. And you'll find out what during activation means as well later on. So here is us doing a bid. Notice it says wrong. So our bid has come in, we know the string. Let's assume that they won. That's the right, it's, they are now the new winning bid. So we need to go tell all of the bidders in our system. All right, get the grain, get the bidder grain, go tell them. This does not work. In an actor framework, an actor can only process one message at a time. What you have here is an ABA problem. So actor A has come in, made a call to actor B, actor B has made a call to actor A. The second call to actor A cannot start because it's waiting for the first call to end. That call cannot end until the B call ends, the B call ends can't finish until the A2 call ends. And we'll show that in a diagram here. So I very, very much like sequence diagrams to show actor relationships. It is the first thing I will write when I'm, show, like, when I'm trying to explain the architecture of an actor in, in my work. I say, right, I'm gonna go draw a diagram. And so I've got reams and reams and reams of these. So here we can think of this as our mailbox being busy. So our actor cannot process any more messages until this line here is completed. Actor B, or auction grain in this case, very confusing, it's B-A-A-B, don't forget it. So we lock up this mailbox. Now before this mailbox can open, this mailbox has to finish as well. This can't start until that's finished. And so what you have is an actor deadlock. Now we'll get ways around this in the next coming slides, but this tends to be the most common mistake that I ever see, is when people say, Dan, my, my actors don't work, I say, right, draw them out, I wanna see what is busy and when. So solution one, we're gonna go through our list of active, uh, active bidders, so people we need to tell, and we're gonna double check to see if the current bidder that's bidding is in that list, obviously is, so we'll just continue past that. We never notify the bidder that has just become the new winning bidder. Does it need to know? Depends on your use case and your requirements. For this instance, no, because we have the return to say success. So what if we change the use case? Now, instead of a list of strings and a list of keys where we go and fetch the grains, we have a list of grain references here. We have a list of I bidder grains. Now we come down here, come down here, come down here, and we say, right, is the string bidder that just came in the same as this active bidder? You can't do that comparison. All you have is a grain reference. Your grain reference does not tell you what its key is. You can't make a call to that actor because you still have the same problem. You're still locking up the mailboxes. But we'll cover why or how we get around it. Not this way. So I've come in and I've said, right, I'm just gonna have an internal task that I'm not gonna wait on. So this means that we avoid ABA. This can still happen. We can still call off to our actors. All of our mailboxes complete nicely. Big problem with it though, in the, when you make a call to an actor, this is not your actor, this interface is your actor. If you make this call, bid internal does not become part of the Orleans task scheduling. So if this is making changes to active bidders, somebody else could come in, enter auction, can I enter find the mailbox this is completely free. So what we have is this being able to change state of the internal actor without being scheduled, which breaks just one of the fundamental laws of actor frameworks, let alone virtual actor frameworks. So how do we do it? So we can have our own internal auction interface, the bid internal. We can say, right, 
I'm going to get myself as a reference. This is an, a, a possible parameter to put, it, to put in from Orleans from the grain base class. And in this case, I'm talking to this I auction grain. When I, when I say do this task, what I'm saying is queue this message onto the uh, scheduling. That means if somebody, while I'm doing this method here, were to enter the auction, they would be queued in properly. And then after the, the queue is completed and we can get to our bid internal, that is when it will take place. This is keeping with proper actor framework behavior. Now, why does this work? Well, when you're saying, get me an I auction grain, you're not talking to auction grain. You're talking to an auction grain reference. Now, the way the Orleans will schedule everything is it will use code generation to say, right, here's the interface that you have. I'm going to generate a bunch of code all to do with um, scheduling and invoking methods and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then I'm going to pass that onto the auction grain. This is where your scheduling happens. When we sell the auction grain to say, get a reference to myself, this is getting this reference here, and this is calling this here. It's the proper way to do active, to send itself in Microsoft Orleans. We have two namespaces down here. You need more than just these two to get Orleans running, but these are the two important ones for this uh, bit of code. Runtime code generation, build time code generation. Uh, I believe only runtime is supported in Orleans 2 at the moment. That might have changed. Um, I've mostly worked in 1.5, and trying to go from 1.5 to 2 is a nightmare, as I found out on Friday. OK. Uh, I prefer the build time code gen anyway, just because you can see what it's actually generating. And we're going to move away from grain implementation and code now. We're going to look at some diagrams. I didn't do this diagram. You can tell because it's colorful. So Orleans cluster. So this is how we do our scalable. We have our individual silos here. This is just your service. And when you get a grain, when you say to grain factory, get me a grain, it will just randomly create it on one of these silos. There are ways so that it can say, oh, go for this silo or this silo. But the standard default behavior is just anywhere. So get me an auction grain, appears up here. Get me a bit of grain, appears here. Notice it's on fire. So if one of our silos were to go down because, I don't know, somebody turned it off, somebody spilled water on the server, anyone, any reason you want, what happens is it'll say, right, get me an auction grain. Oh, this doesn't exist. And Orleans manages it. So that it goes, well, that one doesn't exist. So I'll just recreate the grain here. This is kind of where your idea of activation comes into play. So we're going to look at the grain lifecycle. We've already mentioned about activating and deactivating in the first couple of slides. And now we're going to see what that actually means. So when I say to when I, my bidder grain says to the auction grain, get me an auction grain. Orlean goes, vroom, spins me up an auction grain. It says, right, well, I need to activate it. I need to set up things up for that it needs. So in this case, and you can use a constructor in a grain, you know, don't worry about that. But the more typical thing to do is say, right, when I have this um, possible class here, or this possible method that I've overridden from the grain, I'm going to set up my new list of active bidders. This will always call. If this fails, your grain will not be usable. Um, I don't think anything actually happens in the base, but just in case they add something in the future, best leave it in there. So I've activated my grain. What's going to happen? It's going to active memory. So it exists somewhere across my cluster. As a developer, I don't care where. But I might care that it's alive. So after a configurable timeout, I think the default is 20 minutes. I can't remember. After 20 minutes, Orleans will go, oh, well, nobody's asked this grain anything. So I'll just deactivate. When it's deactivated, it can optionally do some persistence to say, right, any state that I've got, just save it. 
Then if anybody asks for it again, activates, reads out that data, and off we go, can use it again. Now, between silos, so we've already seen in the, I'm gonna go back a slide. So we've already seen between this silo and this silo, that's inter-silo communication. And they can cause a lot of problems in your code if you're not thinking about your data types and how you're passing them. So here we have an example. We've got grain A, grain B, grain B, X, and silo X, and silo Y. Now, we'll do the easy one. We'll, do, we'll stay in one silo for now. So grain A on the same silo as grain B. I don't need to go, I'm not going anywhere. I'm on the same server. So all I need to do is do a deep copy of everything before I pass it. I don't want anybody changing anything after I've given it, a, uh, passed it down the line. There's an asterisk there, which we'll get about on the next slide. So what if I'm gonna call outside my silo? I'm gonna call from between a silo in London and a silo in Manchester. So what I'm gonna to have to do is I'm gonna to have to serialize all of my data to send it down the line to grain B. So that means all of your data types have to be serializable. And again, it's surprisingly easy to forget that they need to be serializable. And so let's go back to that asterisk. So deep copying can be very expensive. So what if we could trust, we could provide Orleans a way of saying, I promise I'm not gonna change this. Okay then, Orleans says, right. If you mark your data type as immutable, I will just pass it as a reference, just as you would in any normal code base. But you've promised not to change it. Now, the best way to do this, or the best way to handle this, is to make sure that it is just logically immutable. Only add things in the constructor, only recreate things. If you do this, no more deep copying within a silo and everything runs nice and fast. Also remember, and I'm just gonna drill it in again because people forget it, serializable. Everything should be serializable. Now, Orleans provides many different uh, serializers and deep copiers built in. It will generate serializers and deep copiers for you. There are ways to add your own if you're a bit um, sadistic like that. So, auction item, it's got a name got a price or a minimum price or whatever. And that is a data type. So let's say I need to make a record of the auction. So the auction's going on, the auction can take, you know, three weeks. If my timeout's 20 minutes, then that grain is gonna deactivate. I'm gonna lose whatever the winning bid is. I'm gonna lose all of my bidder references. So what am I gonna do? I'm gonna do some grain persistence, okay? Now, grain, uh, up here we have some actual configuring of startup. Most of it's just boilerplate um, when you do this, but I thought best to include a little bit. Uh, it changed a lot between 1.5 and 2, if any of you are actually familiar with it, to the point where it just breaks everything. Man. So, when we're building our silo, and I've just been lazy and added a memory grain storage. I'll explain why in a minute. Um, I say, right, I have a SQL data store. Imagine it is a SQL data store. And I'm going to have Orleans manage my grain persistence for me. Now, we have our auction grain now. It's changed a bit. So now we have grain with this type here. The type you saw before to say, right, this is the item that I'm going to be bidding on. We still need to do a little bit of management ourselves, but essentially, when on activate, actually before activation, Orleans will go, right, well, you're this type, you've given me some storage provider, and let's just try and load it up. So it'll load it up into memory. If it fails, for whatever reason, the grain will not work, it stays dead. So, we don't need to handle reads. You can manually force a read out if you really, really want. Um, but when you're doing a set, so you've got this new method here, set auction item. Uh, so say, right, take our base class, or set our base class, and write it. There are a number of different use cases for failures, and most of them just exceptions. Um, 
something I've forgotten actually. Uh, whenever a grain throws an exception, it's dead. It is now no longer usable until it's been deactivated and had a chance to reactivate. It's basically Orleans turning it on and off again. Now, Orleans isn't very clever with its uh, deactivation. It does it by time at the moment. Be nice if in future it does it by memory pressure. Fingers crossed. Now, just to point out, and this is why I've done this, add this memory grain, is that having storage and spinning up tests, they're all very big, they're all very expensive. If you spin up a test cluster in Orleans, it takes forever. So spinning up databases as well is also going to take a while. So what you can do is just say, just use an in-memory one to test. Just use it for test, because you don't, it's, you're going to lose it if the grain dies. Um, and let's go on to a bit more setup. So in our cellar host builder, again, it's just nice and fluent. We say, right, I'm going to configure the service. I'm going to add an auction item service. And it looks like this. So that type isn't a grain. That's uh, just whatever your data service is. Could be HTTP, could just be a SQL wrapper. But now you can just inject that into a constructor of a grain anytime you want. But don't trust it to act like actors. So oh, that's great. We focus now on the server side of things. You know, what is our back end doing? Now let's look a bit into the front end. Now. This just simple class, don't think too much about it. But essentially, we have a cluster client. Our cluster client gets set up by saying, and this is just on dev machines, you want to do this. So our client builder creates our local host. So we're saying, right, we're just going to run locally. It's going to be a bit of a nightmare. And we're going to connect. And it's going to take an age, so we're going to go make a bro. And once it's connected, we can start doing things. So you might have an API, as said before, that just comes into here and says, right, bid with this bidder on this amount. So you say, right, get bidder Dan, or maybe a user ID or something like that, and say, right, bid this amount, and off we go. So then that'll go into your bidder, and off it'll run, and you'll make or you'll buy uh, your bike or whatever it is you're bidding on. And um, that's the core concepts of Orleans. That's what you need, the bare minimum I feel you need to go off tomorrow and start writing Orleans and then phoning me up with hate mail because it's hard. All right, thank you. Thank you very much.